Well, good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. Today, our adventures come to you from Peachtree City, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. Today, we are at Westminster Memorial Gardens to honor a true cultural icon, the Iron Sheik. Days with Jordan the Lion and you all, it begins right now. Unlike many wrestlers who portrayed something they were not, he actually was Iranian. His name was Hossein Kosrov Vasiri. The Iron Sheik passed away last year in 2023. And I was guessing he would be over in this section over here because they made a documentary about him called The Sheik. And at one point in the documentary, they have him come out and he talks about the death of his daughter, one of his daughters. And he says when he's out here that he hadn't been out here since she passed. So she had kind of a unique headstone. So I found hers and then eventually that led me all the way down to the end where he's buried. This is his daughter's headstone, Marissa Vasiri. We'll come back and talk about what happened to her that was very sad. And I wasn't sure if even though he passed away last year, if they would have a headstone for him. But I looked up and when I looked down here, I noticed that there was a cross just like that cross down at the end. And that's where the great Iron Sheik is resting for eternity. He was a true icon. A lot of people in the later generations, I think, probably knew him as being a ranting and raving maniac on Twitter. And he definitely was that, but he was a true athlete. Sorry for standing upon your, or at least the foot of your grave. Sheik, I know you'd be yelling at me, but we did meet. I did have a memorable experience with the Sheik. When I was a kid, my dad got me into wrestling. One of the first things that got me into it was he got me action figures. He got me these little thumb wrestlers and it was Hulk Hogan and the Iron Sheik. So in 2012, I had befriended a lot of uh, comedians at the comedy store in Hollywood and I would go hang out there quite often and one day a couple of the comedians say hey did you hear we're gonna do a roast of the iron sheik his managers are putting it on they're gonna have buff bagwell brutus the barber beefcake uh david arquette and a bunch of the comedians from the comedy store so i said you guys gotta make sure that i somehow get to meet this guy so my friend earl skakel who's my friend to this day uh calls me and says hey you gotta do the ultimate warrior makeup for me Iron Sheik's manager said he's so out of it, if I put the makeup on, he'll think it's him and he'll go crazy and go off on me. So that's how I ended up getting to meet the Iron Sheik was they decided to do a roast. They ended up doing two. They did a later one in New York, but the first one was in Hollywood at the Comedy Store. And um, I did Earl's makeup and of course, the Iron Sheik did go berserk, but I did get a cool photo with him and I did get to talk to him which was cool because, you know, <laughs> you would see what he would post on Twitter and the things that he would put on YouTube. And, um, and he wasn't like that all the time. When we were hanging out backstage, he was actually pretty calm. He was actually really nice. It was just when you provoked him or got him going that uh, that, that side would come out. But his history is absolutely amazing. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Not exactly sure when they're gonna put a headstone here. I kind of thought there would be one here by now. But uh, yeah, he was raised in Iran and wrestled from the time he was like five years old. He was so good that he just became obsessed with it all through his teenage years, was a championship high school wrestler, and then ended up going into the army and was one of the top three army wrestlers in Iran. And then because of that, the Shah of Iran made him uh, one of his bodyguards. So he would be competing for the Olympics while also intermittently being the protector of the Shah of Iran, who 
apparently was in a time where he the Iranian people were kind of being held down. It was kind of oppressive. So he said that the reason that he left, because he was actually on track to be one of the most famous people in the country, but there was a, there was a wrestler that was more famous than him. It was even like, um, kind of like in a Muhammad Ali of Iran. And he trained Kosro. That's how Kosro was basically what he went by. He trained him in wrestling and a, he told a story where he said that when they came back from winning, the Shah asked them what kind of gift they would like. Would they like a car, house, or whatever? And this hero said he wanted better roads, he wanted better education for the children, he wanted better food for the people, and the Shah blew his top. He took that as a personal insult and Vasiri would say, the Sheik would say, he became so popular that like when he would walk down the street, somebody would hand him a flag and everybody would follow him. Then all of a sudden one day they said, if you became an international star in Iran, you became a threat. They would think that you were gonna take over the government. And all of a sudden one day this hero ends up dead and they rule it, uh, him taking his own life and Hossein said, you know, I figured if he didn't have a chance, what chance did I have? So he immediately found his way to New York City. And then he said within a, being in New York City for one week, he was in Minnesota the next week. You see when you have the background that he had where he was, you know, this international famed wrestler, had won medals, was the bodyguard of the Shah of Iran. He didn't have a hard time getting a job. And actually the American Olympic wrestling team hired him to be a coach. And four consecutive years, they won gold medals. Then Vern Gagne, you know, who was running AWA wrestling, also ran a wrestling school. And Cosro kind of thought maybe it would be interesting to try and become a wrestler. And so he ended up going to Vern Gagne's, taking the basically what at the time was Vern would basically run you through the ringer to run you out of there. Like he would put you through, they described it 500 free squats, 500 jumping jacks, 500 sit-ups, 500 push-ups. And then Ricky Steamboat actually told me this. I will uh, put a clip of when I interviewed Ricky Steamboat. He actually told me that uh, the Sheik was who he trained under with Vern. You know who my coach was? Who? Cosmo Vaziri. Sheik. Iron Sheik. Wow. And that was before he became the Iron Sheik. He was wrestling pro. He had just come out of the same camp as Flair. And Vern put him in there as coach because Cosmo was putting us through a, a training style that made him Iranian's national champion. Uh, you know, participate in the Olympics and you know all those national levels. So the Sheik was a legitimately good, real wrestler, but he had to be smartened up in how the business worked, which was you, you didn't actually hurt people. And so for a year he went out being, you know, basically himself with a full head of hair. He would wear, you know, a singlet and um, he just wasn't, it didn't really seem to be getting him anywhere. And Vern Gagne's wife one day said, are you happy with your career in wrestling? He said, no, not really. She said, well, you're Iranian. Why don't you think of doing some sort of Iranian gimmick like a, like a sheik or something? And that changed it all. He immediately shaved his head, grew out the mustache, darkened the mustache, and became an enemy to American fans, which is funny because his one of his daughters said it's so crazy that he would be known as his character being so anti-American when he himself as a person was so pro-America because of all the opportunity that he got and all of the, the life that he got to live here. But he started wrestling as the Sheik, was having some success, and then of course because of the political situation where the, uh, the uh, hostages have been taken in Iran, 
Then they were able to work him into where he was a very, very big, what they called a heel, which was someone who just made people extremely angry. And he was good at it. He would go out there and tell people they were dumb Americans. And I mean, in the 70s and 80s, that's really all it took to get somebody mad was like to challenge their patriotism or insult the flag or insult the country. And he was really good at it. So when it came time to change the guard from... Bob Backlund, who was a great wrestling champion, he was, I mean, legit good wrestler. He had held the title for years, and they had to find the proper opponent to change hands into. But basically, Vince McMahon worked out that Hulk Hogan would eventually get the belt, but they were going to have the Iron Sheik beat Bob Backlund because Bob Backlund was okay with that. Sheik was a legit good wrestler, so he found that to be a believable loss for him. And so he would lose to the Sheik, and then the plan was for Hulk Hogan to eventually take the belt from the Sheik, and that would build up, actually that night when he did beat the Sheik, drop the leg and everything, that was the birth of Hulkamania. So the Iron Sheik tells the story of how Vern Gagne actually approached him and said, I'll pay you $100,000 to break his leg and not lose the title which basically probably would have never launched Hulkamania. WWF would not have ever been what it was, which means WWE wouldn't be what it was. But um, Vasiri, the Sheik, decided not to do it. He, uh, he decided to honor his agreement with Vince McMahon. He dropped the belt to Hulk Hogan and then proceeded to be, you know, used a lot in WWF for the next year or two until WrestleMania 3, he and Hacksaw Jim Duggan were feuding and apparently Hacksaw tells the story that um, one day at the airport he sees the Iron Sheik who he's been battling back and forth in matches and the Sheik says he doesn't have a credit card to rent a rental car and he wants to ride with Jim. And back then you didn't do that because they didn't want fans to see a good guy with a bad guy. And um, they decided to do it anyway. They end up getting pulled over and um, they find uh, cocaine, they find drugs in the car and everything, and it hits the news that, hey, is wrestling fake? The Iron Sheik and Hacksaw Jim Duggan were found in a car together and both guys were fired and told that they would never work in WWE, WWF ever again. But of course, business is business and when the Gulf War broke out, they saw an opportunity to portray Hossein Vasiri, the Iron Sheik, as an Iraqi. So all of a sudden he comes in and he's playing a character that's an Iraqi alongside Sergeant Slaughter. But eventually he basically was resorted to working the indie circuit, not making much money when his life really took the worst turn of all. And that's when I was talking about his daughter being killed because even though he was very busy traveling as a wrestler making a living as a wrestler um he and his wife i mean he was so dedicated that he was working seven nights a week when he and his wife got married they had to get married on a saturday night when he had wrestled saturday afternoon and was going to wrestle the following sunday because that's the only day that he could get off and so even though he had a really busy schedule and was devoted, he was a devoted father. And sadly it was, you know, he would, they would, the daughters would say when he was home, when he wasn't wrestling, if he was home, he would have us and all the kids in the neighborhood um, out doing calisthenics like we were training for the Olympics. And uh, so she said like none of the kids ever wanted to come hang out when he was home and said they weren't allowed to date. He was very strict on that. He said he wasn't raising, he wasn't running a whorehouse and he didn't see any reason why any guy should be calling his daughters. So the girls said they weren't allowed to date until they were out of college, but sometimes they would sneak and do it. And if they did that, he would have them bring the boyfriends over and he would lift weights in front of the boyfriends and then tell them to do it and to match the weights that he was doing. So that's how protective he was. But apparently one night, uh, Marissa had been dating a man for just a short amount of time for like a month, her family said. Beloved daughter, sister, and friend, 
Marissa Jean Vasiri says, with each memory, let our hearts be reminded that nothing can ever take away the beauty we have known for love remains a part of us forever. So yeah, it was 2003. He was, <sighs> she, she'd been dating the guy for like a month and was telling him that it was over and he flew into a rage and choked her to death. And so when they, the girls had to tell, his daughters had to tell him that she had been killed, his wife, um, Carol said, she could just hear him scream from inside the house. He was outside the house. She can just hear him scream a blood curdling scream. And from then on, his life became completely consumed with smoking crack, doing cocaine, smoking pot, just wasting his days away doing drugs as often as possible. I mean, it was sad because he, he was like a family man who now had just been thrown his whole life had been thrown completely in a circle and they said he had always kind of been a drinker but he really ramped it up during this time and this is when he was just he was completely out of control he would actually go with eight by tens to like chuck e cheeses and go to like public places to where he would be recognized and then when the people would recognize him he would charge him like 10 bucks for a signed photo so that he could go get drugs and it was finally his wife just said like you have to make a choice of them or me and she left him and then finally he started to clean up his life and everything but he had a a friend who he had befriended years years and years ago and this man's children came and saw him at wrestling conventions ended up becoming his manager and they helped him clean his life up and they were the ones that um, hosted that that roast for him and everything but it was um, because of them that he could get off the road from wrestling um, he could make money doing signings and online he would you know they were using his voice for all kinds of things on uh, online and using his likeness. I know there have been movies where they <laughs> have used his likeness as like a puppet come to life. So um, his his lasting legacy in pop culture, his Twitter is legendary. The amount of times that he has called Hulk Hogan a jabroni or threatened to break his back or all the different people that he's threatened to make humble, it's, uh, it's amazing. And from a guy who, you know, started in Iran, and you know went through this insane life it was nice to see that in the end he was able to uh to sober up when i met him he was sober so rest in peace the great iron sheik i kind of expected him to be closer to his daughter so when i found his daughters down at the end of the row i was shocked that he wasn't right there beside her but then i kind of thought you know it's possible he and his wife are going to be buried you know together and there wasn't enough room down there so Hopefully he gets a headstone soon. Seemed like a very good family. His wife and surviving children seemed very cool. Like they seemed very loving of him. And I think that uh, whenever the earliest possible time they can get a headstone out here, I'm sure they will. Thank you, Julie Seip Hutzlar and George W. Solling Jr. for becoming my newest Patreons. Rest in peace, the great Iron Sheik. <laughs> Man, true pleasure to watch you, sir. Rest in peace, champ. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a great night and goodbye.